Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the ninth meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones as the meeting papers are provided in digital format tablets. You may see members using these during the meeting and that's my appeal at the start of the meeting. If you see members using their phones and tablets, they're, they're looking at briefing papers and that's what they're doing. But if others could put their, their phones off, that would be that would be welcome. We, yet again, have a full house of MSPs here on the committee. No apologies have been received. And we move to agenda item one, which is Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, annual report and accounts 2015-2016. The committee will take evidence on the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland annual report and accounts 2015-16. And in doing so, can welcome Bill Thompson, Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. Good morning. Morning. And uh, accompanied by Ruth Hogg, Investigations Manager, Office of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. Uh, good morning, Ruth. Thank good you morning. for coming along. Um, uh, Commissioner, I believe you've got some uh, brief opening remarks before we move to questions. Uh, thanks, Convener. They're very brief. Um, first of all, to say thank you for the opportunity to appear before you um, and discuss, answer any questions you have on last year's annual report. Um, as you'll be aware, because they're in the papers, um, I've submitted in advance updates to several of the tables from the annual report. These are updated to the end of September. So in other words, the first half of the current year, um, I simply picked out the ones which related to complaints dealt with by my office um, in relation to councillors uh, and members of public bodies because I presumed, uh, perhaps incorrectly, that that was the main area of interest. Uh, I'm obviously very happy to answer questions on these uh, and on any other parts of the annual report which are of interest to the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Thompson. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll move to questions. And Graham Simpson, MSP, has indicated would like to open the, the question this morning. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I'll just uh, declare an interest in that I'm still a councillor in South Lanarkshire. Um, I, I've also um, been the victim of uh, two complaints over the years. Uh, to the Standards Commission, uh, both of them spurious. Um, can I start off by asking um, about your budget, which is uh, £862,000 a year? Um, and according to uh, a report we've got from Spice, um, only, s only seven cases in one year represented a, a breach. So. By my reckoning, that's uh, over £123,000 a case. Uh, does that represent value for money? Uh, opening question, Mr Thompson. Yes, thanks. Um, first of all, the complaints which I deal with are only part of my remit. Um, approximately one-third of the expenditure of my office goes on the public appointments work. I am the successor to two previous commissioners, um, in fact three, um, one of whom was the commissioner for public appointments. Uh, so the calculation which you've made, which is interesting, is I'm afraid inaccurate. Um, and I think the premise behind it is curious uh, in as much as the implication in the question is that only those which result in a breach are worthwhile. Um, and I, I'm not sure I'm minded to agree with that. There are actually hundreds of complaints which are dealt with every year. And I assume that these are important to the people who submit the complaint. So it's not just those which end up as a breach report and a hearing. Um, I think it's important that all of these are investigated uh, as fairly and as proportionately as possible. Okay, Mr. Simpson, would you like to follow up on that? So you've got hundreds of cases come, come before you. Every, hundreds of complaints. Hundreds of complaints. Uh, and you're telling us that all of them are genuine and worthy of investigation? I. Convener, with respect, I don't think I said that, but until I have made some inquiries, I'm not in a position to take a view as to whether the complaint which comes in is genuine and worthy of investigation. Uh, 
I, I assume you would you would look at the veracity of a complaint once you've investigated rather than before you've, you've investigated it. So you may want to say maybe a little bit more about the process you go through, perhaps. And Certainly, Mr. Convener. Simpson might want to come back in and maybe ask, yep. ask a supplementary in relation to that. Um, some of the complaints we receive are entirely outside my jurisdiction, so they don't receive much attention at all. Um, some of them are quite old in terms of the circumstances that they relate to, and we generally don't investigate complaints relating to matters which occurred more than 12 months previously. There are some exceptions to that. Other complaints relate purely to the key principles set out in the councillor's code, or for that matter, in the code of conduct for the members of the public body. Um, and in terms of the way these codes are drafted, those complaints um, cannot constitute a breach, even if I were to agree that Councillor X had been dishonest or had failed to be properly open, or whatever the uh, key principle might be. We have introduced, uh, or we're in the process of introducing an, a new approach where if it is not clear that the complaint relates to or could relate to a provision of the relevant code, we engage with the complainer before we start the process um, so that we find out whether it is something that is within my remit and therefore worth investigating. If it's not, uh, we won't proceed any further. Um, and around a half of the complaints which I receive, and this is in very broad terms, don't proceed to any sort of detailed investigation. Um, now, back to um, Mr. Simpson's question. Um, I'm not yet convinced that it's a waste of time to go through that process um, and reach the determination that they're not worth investigating further. I appreciate that some complaints are vexatious or frivolous, um, although it's difficult to tell when they come in. Um, and I think we have to go through a process to at least do the best we can to determine whether they're worth investigating or not. Do you want to follow up on some of that, Mr. Simpson? Well, surely if uh, out of the hundreds of cases that come before you every year, and, and only seven of them um, ultimately amount to a breach, that tells you something, does it not? I think there's a number of conclusions that could be drawn from that, but uh, in terms of... Well, I would be interested to know which conclusion uh, Mr. Simpson thinks should I'm be drawn. I'm asking you. What conclusion do you draw? That's fine, but you just maybe just finish off your thoughts on this, Mr. Thomas, and we'll take Mr. Simpson back in a moment. Yeah. I, I'm at risk of sounding facetious here, but this is a serious point. My conclusion is that seven of, if it is seven, and the number varies from year to year, in fact, it's near or double that number this year, but um, my conclusion is that seven of these disclose a breach of the code. Okay, uh, do you want to explore this, this further, Mr. Simpson? Convener, I may well come back. I don't want to hog things. Um, okay. Other members may have questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just, just, I suppose just before we do move on, uh, a, a casual observation may be that um, a number of things could be happening um, one could be that maybe members of the public are unclear in relation to when they should or shouldn't approach yourself or or or, or, or the commission, um, and therefore they're not necessarily doing it inappropriately or vexatiously. They're they're, they're doing it um, for genuine reasons. Are you able to tease out how many people who who make a complaint are? are just not informed uh, sufficiently in relation to the appropriate process to go through if they're dissatisfied with uh, how a councillor has dealt with a case or something they've read in the newspaper about a councillor or an interaction they've had with them at their surgery or, or whatever it may be. Is there an information gap out there about the purpose? I made the point um, to last the committee which, before which I appeared last year that around a fifth of the complaints which we received related purely to the key principles. Now, I'm not being critical of people who put in complaints because it's not obvious from the code that you cannot breach the key principles unless you happen to read one sentence in paragraph 2.1 of the councillor's code. Um, so I think these people genuinely felt they had an issue. Um, I also think they were 
probably not sufficiently clear about what my remit is and what I can investigate. I'm pleased to say that the percentage of complaints in the first six months of this year, which relate purely to the key principles, is significantly lower. So I think some progress is being made. And as I say, when complaints come in, we do try and tease out with the complainer whether, even though they may only have referred to one of the key principles, whether there's actually something else under the code which could be relevant. I'm not trying to generate complaints, but I am trying to make sure that people who complain are not sent away um, dismissed without the issues that they have raised being properly addressed. In case you would automatically exclude that, that one fifth, I know that we were talking about two years ago, I think, that one fifth yep. of complaints that, that come in under a criteria which you couldn't possibly look at in any greater detail and, and, and make a ruling on, you would still interrogate, lo interrogate those to a degree in case there was something else going on that would be a valid complaint? Indeed. I mean, if I can give you one example without mentioning any names, um, we had a complaint this year from somebody who was unhappy about a comment attributed to somebody in a newspaper article. The newspaper article purported to be repeating something which had been said on social media uh, by a councillor. Um, now, the information was insufficient for me to take it forward. Um, I did endeavour to trace the social media um, issue to which the person was referring uh, and failed, so my office wrote back and asked for further clarification uh, and indicated that if we didn't hear anything within a certain period, we would simply close the file, and that's where we are. That individual did not come back, I suspect. They were prompted by something they saw in a newspaper, which they, and this may be Mr. Simpson's point, which they thought was shocking, um, and decided to make a complaint, but th there was no substance to it. Okay. Um, uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. To, to follow on, can I also indicate that I'm a serving councillor in Perth and Cross Council. Uh, I think that the code was, in my view, I think the code was brought in as a safeguard. Uh, but I think in practice, what the code has become, uh, in my view also, Convener, is that it's an opportunity to challenge, it's an opportunity to attack, and it's an opportunity to condemn individuals. And that reading through the whole process uh, of, of the number of uh, allegations that are made against individuals uh, where the code is, is used, uh, that may well be some of the cases. Planning seems to be one of the, the biggest areas, and planning is always a little bit, not necessarily black and white, there's a lot of grey areas in, as, as in my 18 years as a councillor uh, that I uh, would, would suggest that it's not always a, say, a black and white situation uh, when you look at a planning application and, uh, and, and people's impressions uh, and people's processes uh, about planning and enforcement uh, and it's a perception uh, sometimes uh, that uh, councillors are maybe more informed or, or, or have more information uh, than the general public have and that can sometimes cause some uh, difficulties uh, when they believe that uh, you know if it's their planning application and the authority is managing that application and individuals have got more power or more influence uh, if things are being breached. So I, I can understand why a number of people do get a little bit excited about uh, planning applications and how it's processed and how the information for councillors is received uh, and the applicants are received. Uh, my question would be, out of all of that, uh, where, as I said, I, I perceive it as a, a challenge, uh, an area that people can uh, condemn uh, individuals, do you, as an individual who's managing the whole process, do you believe... Uh, that there are areas within that that are becoming much more prevalent uh, in the way that individuals or organisations choose to uh, challenge, attack or condemn? Um, convener, the short answer is yes. Um, to give a bit more detail, we do report separately uh, there's a table in the report on the number of complaints which are related to planning issues mm -hmm. um, it was until recently the single biggest area although i think it is now in danger of being overtaken by complaints of disrespect S some of which may relate to planning cases but most mm -hmm. don't um, i think it is good news that the percentage of complaints relating to failure to declare or register an interest 
uh, that percentage is going down and that of course is an area that can be brought up in relation to planning applications. Um, I do agree that the opportunity to complain to my office is one which is tempting to people who are dissatisfied with planning decisions or the way a planning process has proceeded. Uh, and there have been quite a number of complaints which has certainly been prompted by dissatisfaction about the planning process. In some cases, I think people who've complained have wrongly assumed that were I to reach a decision that there had been a breach, that would allow them some way of clawing back the decision made under the planning process, and that just not, is not the case. I, mean, I, I would agree uh, that, that, that individuals do not like the answer when it comes to a planning situation, uh, and they use your op the opportunity of going to yourself uh, as a, uh, a way of, once again, challenging that process in their attempt that they can then progress forward. Uh, and as you've rightly indicated, that's not your role or your remit, uh, and you don't make a change to the decision. Uh, but it, it, it still doesn't stop people putting it in, so their perception is that by doing that, they think they can progress. And, and the second area I talk about, you, you mentioned respect. Now, that is a very fluid issue, uh, how people respect or not respect. Uh, you know, uh, I've been at many meetings over years where uh, individuals can get a bit heated, uh, situations can become quite heated, uh, 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 and, and words are said or actions are done. Uh, uh, and that then is perceived once again as a, as a breach. Uh, uh, and it, it entirely depends on the individual as to how they manage that. So, you know, a few on that would be quite useful too. Um, Karina, my decision on these isn't the end of the story, of course, because I report to the Standards Commission if I consider that there has been a breach. Um, so ultimately, it is their decision. Um, respect or the lack of it is a very difficult issue. It is a key principle quite correctly, I think. Uh, I think if we were to conduct public business without respect, um, that would be a sorry state of affairs. But how to determine whether something is or is not uh, disrespect is more difficult. Um, I think the context, I think you're suggesting this, um, is often critical. Um, and <laughs> it's just a growing area uh, in terms of the work of my office. And one of the further complications is that they, and I mentioned this the last time I appeared before the committee, um, Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights protects freedom of speech. Um, and the jurisdiction of the European Court um, has made it very clear that statements made in a political context are given much wider latitude than other statements made in different contexts when you're looking at whether something uh, is a breach in terms of respect or not. Um, and that is... Quite a live issue. Back on there, Mr. Stewart. No, thank you, Convener. Right, move things on a little bit. Um, uh, Eileen Smith. Thanks, Convener, and morning, Bill. Thanks for joining us today. I was actually interested in that whole issue of respect as well, because obviously, in Parliament, um, and having chaired the Parliament in previous session, that's something that is quite difficult to judge in the parliamentary chamber, but it's a big part of the proceedings in there too. So I'm interested in the answer that you gave to that. But overall, when I look back at the um, official report from the last time you were in front of the previous committee, you, you mentioned in that that if the code could be simplified and made clearer, that would make everybody's lives better, was the words that, that you used. And you went on to say that um, it, it would be ministers would have to agree to a reason to review it. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Has anything moved on that? Is that something that we need to be looking at? Um, from my point of view, it would be very welcome if you were to look at it. Um, I know that the Standards Commission, to whom, as I mentioned, I report, um, have a list of areas of the code which they would like to see revised, improved. Um, I believe the government is due to consult soon on possible changes to a particular aspect of the code. Uh, and my understanding is that the Standards Commission will take that opportunity to submit their wish list, if you like, of, of areas requiring improvement. Um, I was asked by the convener of the previous committee to submit uh, a note of 
points which I thought required attention. I did that um, around the time of dissolution, actually, in, in March uh, of this year. Um, and I certainly hold to the points which I made in that letter, which, if the convener wishes, I'm, I'm happy to repeat now. Um, and I think there are other areas. There's one that is plainly wrong, uh, and it's not at all helpful. It's in relation to registration and declaration of interests, uh, which are governed in part by a statutory instrument which requires registration within, uh, in essence, a month uh, of the interest being acquired or changing. The code itself, paragraph 4.2 of the Councillor's Code, refers to the need uh, to check your entries and review them at least annually, which is not helpful. Uh, because you can be familiar with the code and yet not appreciate that actually you could be in breach if you leave it for three or four months uh, before you register something. Um, so, I mean, that's just a blatant error. Um, there are other things which are complex. Coming back to Mr. Stewart's point, planning is difficult in itself. Um, part five of the code, or the councillor's code, applies to planning. Uh, it has several different iterations of the same test. Uh, that's difficult for anybody to get their head around. Part 7 also applies, and that same test isn't referred to in one of the provisions in Part 7, which also applies to planning. So I, I actually think it's very difficult for people, uh, it's difficult for councillors who are uh, advised to know where they stand, and it's particularly difficult for members of the public uh, to know what is a proper complaint. Do you want to follow up on that? No, I think that's very helpful, and um, thanks for, for uh, sharing that again with us today. And as a new committee, we'll obviously look at that um, letter you sent the previous convener and take stock of that as a committee as well. Thank you for flagging that up Thank for you. our attention. I know that uh, Mr. Simpson is supplementary in some of the points raised there. Just on the on on, on planning, because um, you'll be you'll be aware that um, one one of the rules for councillors is that you're not allowed to publicly comment on a planning application if you were then subsequently part of the decision-making process around that. Um, that's always struck me as quite a, a bizarre thing um, because we're, we're elected to you know, form views, take decisions, represent people, and we can express views on any other issue we like, uh, but not planning. Um, that, that rule was scrapped in England, I believe, and I just wonder whether you think it, that that should happen here, whether that would be helpful? Um, I think that's a policy issue on which I'm very wary of um, commenting, in part because I may have to deal with complaints about breaches of that rule, and that could put me in a slightly odd position. Um, I would observe that the rule is actually even more complex than that, in as much as, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, convener, um, Councillors can comment at the policy development stage, but they can't then comment uh, on specific applications if they're then going to be dealing with them. Um, and I think that puts councillors in a very difficult position at times. I, I, I readily appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, I think Mr. Stewart wants to follow up on some of that. I mean, can I, can I tease that slightly further forward? Obviously, when a complaint's put forward, and as I say, many of them are planning, the investigation that then takes place uh, and, and the processes you go through, uh, it would appear that a number of them don't progress, maybe through lack of evidence, uh, or, or how, how, do they, how do they not end up being progressed further uh, in your process? A number of circumstances. Um, that is quite correct. It may be that the evidence isn't there. Um, it may be that the evidence is completely contradictory Mm -hmm. um, the worst situation is the classic he said, she said, yeah. and nobody else was involved, mm -hmm. uh, in which case I have no basis for making a determination. Um, more often than not, it's down to interpretation, I think, people seeing things differently. Um, I think, as a general rule, the people against whom a complaint has been made given that there are penalties uh, possible under this process in the seven or more cases which do come forward as breaches, um, the code has to be interpreted relatively strictly. Um, that would apply if we were talking about the criminal law, and I think it's fair to take the same sort of approach here, um, which tends to mean that the person against whom the complaint has been made will be given the benefit of the doubt, if there is any real doubt. Mm -hmm. um, 
that, of course, is not satisfactory to the people who've complained, um, and I receive comments to that effect, but I still think that's the correct way of going about it. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm just going to give a heads up to well, one or two of our committee members who'd asked to come in on social media. You'll know who you are. I'm going to take you in a second. But I'm just asking a more general point. I'm just trying to get a taste of what's happened in the last year. Um, so, in the year 1415, there was 680 complaints against councillors. Uh, in the year 1516, there was 202 complaints against councillors. Sorry to over-trivialise it. Have councillors been better behaved in the last year than they were before? Are they getting their act together? Are they... Or, or well, boxing more cleverly. What, what's think, going on? We've, we've, got some, we've got some councillors on, on our committee here. Have, have they all been better behaved in the last year? <laughs> I'm making no comment on individuals in the room, obviously, <laughs> convener. But um, the, the previous year's figures were distorted by a by multiple complaints in relation to one issue in the city of Aberdeen, and because of the way we are required to record and report on complaints. Um, there were 524 relating to the one issue. So the actual overall number in that year uh, was significantly less than the 600 nod that are reported. So I, I don't think, unfortunately, that you can deduce from that uh, that behaviour has improved to the point where there are significantly fewer complaints. And the number of complaints isn't necessarily, of course, an indicator of behaviour at all. It's just the number of people who are motivated to submit a complaint. That was perhaps just a more light-hearted way to ask the question why there was such a variation in, in numbers there, but that's very helpful to put that. Can, on, I, can on I just add, convener, uh, I'm pleased to report that in the first half of this year, the volume of complaints is on a downward trend, which from my point of view is very welcome. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Now, I'd mentioned social media, and uh, our clerking team just mentioned that social media in Section 3 of the Code was actually one of the things that you'd previously contacted the, the committee in relation to. And I know Andy that Whiteman had indicated um, before the start of today's meeting, although he was particularly interested to look at some areas around social media. Uh, Mr Whiteman, now might be a good time to maybe raise some of those points. Yes, thank you, uh, convener, and thank you for coming along today. Um, in your evidence last year, you, you said that at the top of your list is the way in which the code applies to statements that are made on social media. Given that social media is becoming more prevalent, uh, more widespread, um, uh, more, more uh, used more frequently by elected officials and many others in society, um, has anything changed since you made that statement? Um, and in particular, what do you think the impact might be going forward on your potential workload? I know you say complaints are dropping, but they go up and down, I'm thinking more strategically. Indeed. Um, well, convener, the one thing that has changed is that the Standards Commission have issued revised guidance in relation to social media, which I think is helpful. Um, it has limits in as much as sitting in my seat, um, I can only assess complaints against the code itself. Whether someone has had regard to the guidance obviously is a factor, but at the end of the day, my decision has to be on whether someone has or has not uh, been involved in a breach or something which is a breach of the code. So the guidance is helpful but not a uh, determinant of the issue. Um, the difficulty which I raised is that the code was drafted before social media was so prevalent. Uh, it makes no reference to it. Um, the code correctly only applies to the actions that we're talking about councillors here, obviously applies to members of public bodies as well, but it only applies to those people when they're acting in that capacity. And one of the real difficulties with social media is working out whether the person who has said whatever they've said was doing so as an individual um, or as a councillor. If they were doing it as an individual, then the code doesn't apply. If they were doing it as a councillor, at least arguably the code applies. And then the question is whether they were commenting uh, in a way that would be covered by the freedoms under Article 10 of the European Convention. Yes, this is an interesting uh, discussion arose last time you were here on that question. Um, I think it's partly the nature of the, of, of the media that makes the boundaries between when a councillor is acting as in their capacity as a councillor and not um, rather more difficult. In the past, yep. councillors were acting in their capacity, obviously, when they were in council chambers and council business, uh, speaking at meetings and all the rest of it. When they were at home, they weren't. But now when they're at home, they've got almost greater opportunities to speak to the world um, than they did previously. 
Um, are, I mean, are you any further forward in being able to draw that line a little bit more clearly, partly to assist councillors themselves in how they interact with the public? Regrettably, no, convener. I, I wish that I were. Um, I suppose over time there will be some clarity in as much as complaints where I find a breach will be considered by the Standards Commission at a public hearing and they will make decisions, um, assuming that those are related to each other in some way and consistent, then, then the picture will become clearer. Uh, but we will still have the problem of how the code is applied and when is a councillor not a councillor. It's an impossible question to answer, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay, just, just a brief follow-up onto that and then we'll move to our final uh, area of, of questioning. So does, does that leave a kind of murky area for, for yourself, Mr. Thompson? You know, you look at these Twitter accounts and, and the biographies will be uh, tweeting in a personal capacity or of you on my own, not my employer or whatever. Does that then give the individual running that account uh, uh, you know, a blank check to just kind of say what they like without running risk of breaking the code? Or is that, is that the issue that there's a total lack of clarity in relation to this? I think murky is a good word. It's, um, saying you're doing this as an individual um, isn't necessarily a, a defence, if that's the right word. Um, and even if you're making comment on a matter of public concern, uh, which can be considered to be political expression in technical terms, um, the, the protection which is given by Article 10 isn't complete. <coughs> there are things which are just beyond the pale, if I can use that phrase. Um, and the difficulty is knowing just quite which side of that fence they, they fall. Okay, I think that, that's helpful to put that on the record. Um, uh, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. So, turning to the public appointments part of your role, if you don't mind, uh, Bill. Um, we note that, that for the first time more women were appointed than men. So, my question would be, um, I suppose, in what way was that achieved? I note in your annual report you say that a range of outreach activities to encourage applications for underrepresented groups was undertaken. So, maybe a bit more detail about that. And also then, following on, how you can approach um, the poor representation in other uh, sectors and how that can be addressed. Yes, Convener, um, I welcome the opportunity to comment on that. It's quite a, a big topic. Uh, I'll try and be brief. Um, my office is now working in a different way uh, with the staff in the government who are responsible for the administration of the public appointments process. Um, and that is in part thanks to uh, the government at a political level um, giving priority and prominence uh, to the issue of diversity on public boards, specifically uh, um, as a first priority, uh, the gender imbalance. So the, the political climate, if you like, has changed helpfully. Um, I think that has made it easier for the staff are actually involved directly um, to apply themselves at an earlier stage when public appointments are to be made. Um, we now have a process of early engagement with Scottish Government staff, including at a fairly senior level, those who, who, who will be involved in a public appointment. And thinking about it in advance um, allows the whole process to be done in a way which is less likely simply to ask the same questions and get the same answers. Um, so uh, the way that the board itself is looking at succession planning is improving because they're being encouraged to do so and supported to do so. Uh, the way in which um, the people from my office, the public appointments advisors, are engaging with the appointment panel, which is different from time to time, um, allows better preparation Sometimes just the way that the questions are asked uh, makes a difference. Um, the way in which the requirements are specified certainly makes a difference. Uh, and as, as you've mentioned, there is active outreach, not in all cases, uh, but there has been some very effective uh, outreach. Uh, for example, a public meeting in Mary Hill, um, which was done jointly with Cleta Glasgow and Clyde Health Board when they were trying to involve people in the board who had experience of community involvement uh, and that, that was a successful exercise. There have been 
a number of these. Um, and actually, um, although some areas require even more thought, the overall position is improving. Uh, and I do have figures which, if the convener allows, I, I can give you to indicate progress that is being made in the course of this year. Um, you have in Table 25 before you the demographic profile of board membership. Um, the position um, as at the end of 2015 and the position as at the end of October this year uh, is that um, female board membership is now at 44.3%, which is a an increase, I accept it's still below the Scottish population census figure, but it is still, it is an improvement. Um, the percentage of people who have disclosed the disability has gone up, sorry, has gone down. That is the, the one that has gone down, that's now 9.7%, um, and that is a significant gap between there and the Scottish population of 19.6%. Um, the proportion of black and uh, minority ethnic uh, people represented on boards has gone up from 3.5 to 4 percent uh, and that does match the Scottish population uh, census figures. Uh, those aged 49 and under have gone up from 17.6 to 19.7 percent. That is still way below 54.3 but it is a move in the right direction. Uh, and those um, who have recorded uh, that they're lesbian, gay and bisexual has gone up from 3% to 3.7%. That is still below the target we have of, of 6%, but it's, again, a move in the right direction. Do you want to follow up? No, that's very interesting. And if you wish to obviously send in any further comments on that, then I'm sure we'd be happy to receive it. But, um, yeah, thank you very much for that. I suppose the thing in those figures you give Mr Thompson is it then gives the committee an anchor for subsequent uh, uh, evidence to the committee on an annual basis in relation to how these figures change. Where would the responsibility sit with, with government, with yourself, in relation to making further progress in, in relation to that in the year ahead? And we're almost out of time, but if there's anything you want to say in that at all, which would, be, which would allow us to then do more effective scrutiny at next year's uh, the, evidence session. The primary responsibility sits with government. Ministers make the appointments. Um, I have set out to work in partnership with government on this while still retaining my regulatory position. Um, we have a very open working relationship. In fact, two of the government staff who are involved in this happen to be here today to hear um, what is being said about it because uh, there is an openness, there's an interest, uh, there's a priority being given to this. Uh, there are a number of initiatives which are underway um, I think probably if you're short of time convener, it might be better if I were to submit a letter if you're comfortable with that um, uh, to the clerk after this meeting. I can give you a bit more detail and I can also supply a copy of these figures which I've read out. I apologise for doing so, but I only received them fairly recently myself. No, I think that's very helpful and that does take us to what time has defeated us here. That does take us to the end of the, this evidence session. So can I, can I thank uh, Mr Thompson and Ms Hall, can I thank both of you for coming along here uh, th this morning. Uh, that, that ends agenda item one and can we suspend the meeting briefly to allow uh, us to make preparations for agenda item two. <coughs> thank you.
Okay, um, good morning everyone and we'll get going again, um, moving on to agenda item two. Uh, and we're about to have a roundtable session on the Scottish local government elections and voting. The committee will take evidence from a number of witnesses in participation in Scottish local government elections and voting. Today's session will take place in a roundtable format to allow for a more free-flowing discussion of the issues. Uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll get introductions from everyone here, including uh, our witnesses and, and MSPs. We'll do that in a moment. But first of all, uh, can, can I welcome uh, students from our Ladies High in Motherwell and St Andrews uh, secondary in Coat Bridge, who are in the public gallery today, and uh, opportunity to have a chat with you after uh, this morning's session, uh, if you wish, that's welcome as well. And also give a nod to uh, the Local Government uh, Committee's Twitter account, where we asked for a number of views and how we encourage voter participation at local government elections. We've had some responses to that. Uh, anyone who is watching this out with this room, or even in this room, feel free to go on to our Twitter account and give, give suggestions, so a plug for that there. Um, and we will now move to introductions of, of those around the table. So I'm Bob Doris, I'm an MSP for uh, Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn, and I'm the committee convener, and we'll go around this way. Okay, um, my name is Lynn Benny, and I teach and study politics at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, Elaine Smith, MSP, Labour Central Scotland, and deputy convener of the committee. I'm Willie Sullivan, Director of Electoral Reform Society Scotland, and I published this book a couple of years ago called Missing Million, Why Over a Million Scots Choose Not to Vote and What It Means for Our Democracy. Uh, I'm Andy Whiteman, MSP, representing Lothian for the Scottish Green Party. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ruth Maguire, representing the SNP and Cunningham South area. I'm Victoria Hannigan. I'm a secondary school teacher. I teach Morning Studies, and I represent the Morning Studies Association. I'm Dave Watson. I'm the Head of Policy at Unison Scotland. I'm Alexander Stewart. I'm a member of Mid-Scotland Fife for the Conservatives and I've been a serving councillor since 1999. Uh, hello, I'm Debbie King, Shelter Scotland, and I'm the Campaigns and Public Affairs Manager. I'm Kenneth Gibson, SNP, MSP for Cornwall North. I'm Keely Thorpe, Campaigns and Policy Manager at Enable Scotland, um, an organisation for people who have learning disabilities. Uh, Graham Simpson, uh, represent Central Scotland, uh, and I'm a Conservative. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll be joined by Sarah Patterson, who's been, been held up this morning. She'll join us shortly and, and join our, our roundtable event. Now, just to get the conversation um, started, um, our witnesses that we have here today, we're clearly keen to hear from yourselves about how we how we stem the, the trend of, of decreasing uh, voter turnouts, particularly in local government elections, we've got a new cohort of voters and 16 and 17 year olds, as well as a variety of other particularly less represented groups in relation to those who, who do vote at elections. Um, there's clearly uh, short term concerns about next year's uh, local authority elections, but a long term view on how we, we, we stem that decline and turn that around. So um, just to get the conversation going, uh, I'm sure you'll have lots of different suggestions in both the short term and long-term approach to this, but if you could pick one, th one thing, let's say in the, in the short term that you would like to see happen uh, to try and encourage those uh, to vote in, in May's elections next year, perhaps you could um, say a little bit about that just now, and then we'll just take it from there and the conversation can move on. So who would like to make a suggestion about how we, we uh, increase voter turnout for next year's elections, particularly amongst groups that are less likely to, to go out and cast their votes? Uh, yeah, Debbie King. Um, I work with Shelter Scotland, so we work with a, a number of people who have housing need, whether they're homeless or trying, trying to get out of temporary accommodation into permanent accommodation. And I suppose from our perspective, a lot of it is about enabling people to register to vote. That's the kind of first mm. starting point. We have a lot of difficulty, we know, with people who are in the private rented sector, for example, very underrepresented in terms of registering to vote and also people who are homeless and with no fixed address, either not understanding they do have a right to vote and how they would go about registering to do so. So I suppose it's about information and support initially. Thank you very much. Any other witnesses want to, want to come in? Keely. Um, yeah, um, I would make a, a plea for 
really um, informed and targeted voter registration and education campaigns um, too. Um, last year, uh, sorry, earlier this year, we worked with the uh, Electoral Commission to enable the vote, um, and that was a targeted campaign for people who have learning disabilities. So it was it was very specifically targeted in terms of not just the process of registering to vote, but why you why you need to vote. Um, but also there's that the education side of things from from parties, uh, why why people should vote for you, um, and for for, for people with learning disabilities, some of the information that, that, that they're getting is just not accessible and not easy to understand. And that, for me, means that they're not making informed decisions about their right to vote. Um, so that would be my, my suggestion. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of other witnesses. We've got some MSPs starting to indicate they'd like to make some comments, but would any of our witnesses want to add to that at the moment? Victoria, take you next. Right, so, um, my kind of comment that was saying a greater time investment from you know authorities in particular you know not all authorities deliver modern science as part of the curriculum but I think there needs to be a recognition that you know political literacy and citizenship education is an incredibly valuable part across the curriculum in Scotland therefore I think there should be time made available for all schools across Scotland to have proper time investment by a proper trained modern studies teacher that can ensure that the voters have the appropriate adequate information to ensure they can make informed decision making choices and would that be irrespective of whether young people had chosen modern studies or not? It would yeah, be a whole I mean, school that, initiative, would it? That's, I think, you know, as I said, you know, not all schools across Scotland have one since so part of the curriculum. Therefore, I think there needs to be a greater emphasis, you know, from the Scottish Government that all schools should either deliver this or ensure there's a greater time, greater, um, time available for members of staff who can receive proper training to deliver this information to pupils rather than, you know, through a period of PSE. I should declare an interest as a former modern studies teacher myself, but um, thank you for putting that <laughs> on the record. Uh, Dr. Benny. Um, I would just, you know, emphasise what's been said before that, you know, the registration, targeted re registration campaigns are very, very important. But if you would ask me whether there was one thing that would make a difference, I think maybe communication from from government, from experts, from political parties themselves, it should emphasise just how important local government is. Because I think, you know, relative to, to other institutions, there is a, a perception out there that perhaps it's, it, it is not that important and we have to, in some way, you know, challenge, counter that. OK, thank you very much. Willie, do you want to Yeah, I, I think emphasis on the, the new cohort is probably the, the, the one thing where you might make a little bit of a difference. Um, uh, I was go going to say this before I knew you were a modern studies teacher, but I think modern studies is, you know, we're really lucky to have it in Scotland. I know my colleagues in England are quite envious of us to have it. Um, but I think, you know, so I, so I think you know, using, using the modern studies teachers and in the schools with the new cohort would probably be the one thing that might make a little bit of difference this time. Thank you. Uh, Dave Watson. Well, I also declare this is my wife's a modern studies teacher. That's why we're in the business. Um, but uh, so I, I think there are a lot of um, uh, very practical um, uh, issues that, that have been touched upon. I suppose um, my point's closer to that of Lynn Benny's, which is I think people tend to vote on their perception of uh, how important uh, a particular tier of government is. And clearly, as a local government trade union, I think our, our view would be that, um, that it's important that, um, that councils are seen to be an important part of the government of the country not just simply administration uh, and therefore and then coupled with that councils themselves have a duty and a role not always well carried out in our view in terms of ensuring that voters have an opportunity to engage not just at voting time but also in relation to uh, engaging in the in in the issues of the council throughout the year so it's a slightly longer term perspective but nonetheless I think that's one of the reasons that the turnout is so low okay thank you very much and uh, uh, Kenneth Gibson, MSP, you've been very patient because you indicated right at the start of uh, that line of questioning you wanted to come in for a supplementary, but if you want yeah, to go in now, Yeah, Kenneth. thanks very much, Camina, because a lot of what's in, in, in the, the kind of submissions talks about, you know, process, for example, you know, the uh, Electoral Commission talking about providing voters with information on how to register on a deadline for doing so, provide voters with information on the date of the elections and how to cast their votes. I think that's all important, but I think the most important thing is to actually let folk know what local authorities actually do, and I think that's really important. Victoria touched on the citizenship aspect. I know when I was at school, it was absolutely nothing whatsoever taught about um, what the, any electoral uh, system did, what any parliament did, in fact. And things have changed for the better, but the most important thing is to let people know that folk don't actually know what local authorities do. Uh, how important they are, how many people they employ, um, the, the key uh, uh, issues they discuss, of obviously, um, you know, social work, housing, whatever it happens to be. And I think that's what's important because 
Folk think the MSPs deal with half of these things these days, and, and I think it's very important to go back to first principles and uh, a campaign of information to let people know what uh, councils do is vital. And I would have to say, Lynn Benny, I'm, I'm really uh, um, um, delighted to see that you mentioned posters, election posters. I think that is an issue. Um, you know, I think that uh, having a bit of razzmatazz in an election, you know, people actually seeing there's an election on by having posters uh, uh, throughout uh, a local authority area, I think, uh, is significant, just as advertising works, it works. And I say that as someone who um, laments the day when they no longer can climb up a ladder because the administration and our local authority actually, or the, rather the combination of parties against the administration, banned postering. So I'd like to see I, that come I'm back. going to keep MSP comments brief on this. It's got them vexed, the idea of election posters. I'm delighted I don't have to go up ladders anymore. I tell you that much, Mr Gibson, but it has lost something of an impact at a local level uh, in relation to elections. Uh, briefly, Elaine Smith and but, then Graham Simpson, <laughs> and then we'll take her witnesses in. Thanks, convener, which is why I actually wanted to put it out there, whether or not the posters... I mean, a lot of the issues with posters were... Um, one party putting them up, maybe another party taking them down, arguments, debates, police getting involved, all of that stuff. Mm. But if these posters were not party political posters, if these posters were actually advertising the election rather than advertising different parties, is that something that could be think, yeah. thought about? And I noticed that um, it was Dr Benny that raised it in her submission. And we're going to roll that together with Graham Simpson's brief comment, and then I think we should go to Dr Benny after that. Mr Simpson? Uh, is this just some posters? Well, yes, because that's what we're talking about at the moment. Okay, yes, it, just posters. Um, I, I, I take a different view to uh, Kenny Gibson on this. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't describe posters as uh, razzmatazz. Uh, <laughs> cl climbing up ladders certainly isn't. Um, I don't think they have uh, much impact myself, and that's why... I voted to ban them in South Lanarkshire. Okay. Dr Benny, it was, it was in your, you, you, your evidence. You've got the MSPs vexed about posters. I'll take Do Dr Benny and then I'll take Mr Silver. Well, lamp posts don't vote, but it does bring us back to public information and public awareness. Dr uh -huh. Benny. Okay. Um, well, at, at the risk of um, perhaps antagonising some people, um, I would say that you know, academics over the years, over the decades, in lots of different types of elections, have, have really tried to analyse the importance of I don't know, visibility of, of campaigns. And a part of that is posters. And it's, you know, it does bring a certain vibrancy, colour to, to political campaigns. And if there's, if there's one thing, you know, I think that we are clear about is that visible campaigns really, really matter in terms of, you know, support for individual parties, but also in terms of turnout. So, you know, I do, you know, strongly think that it's been a mistake. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one possible solution to, to help with turnout that could be easily achieved, I would say. OK, Willie Sullivan. I've not much to say on posters. I think they might make a tiny little bit of difference, but not a massive difference. But I, I was going to respond to Kenny a wee, a wee bit there about this idea of telling people stuff, telling people how important local government is, telling people... You know, I think it's, you know, it, it's got to go beyond that in a way. People have got to feel, really, how important it is. They've got to feel the impact upon their lives. They've got to feel that they perhaps have some influence um, over what's happening. And, and I think... I think that's why I, I, we've got we've got a project about, and it comes back to the modern studies things about a democratic school, where p kids actually, you know, it's okay to tell people about processes and procedures, but actually until you feel what it's like to make decisions or feel what it's like to take part in democracies, then then you're going to disengage in it. And I think that's kind of one of the major points that we want to make is like going into the ballot box and making the vote is a really important part of democracy, but actually it's the end process. The real democracy takes place in the spaces and uh, places where people have discussions, debates and conversations and, and feel what it's like to move through decision making and, and, and make decisions on behalf of each other as well as just on them as themselves. Okay, and um, how, how would we we do that? Uh, could you give a suggestion, Mr Sullivan? Sort of well, I, I mean, we, we, we talk about a democratic society, which is, uh, is, is if you imagine, a, a society honeycombed with lots of small democratic spaces where people are having uh, these decision-makings, where it's community-owned energy companies, community housing companies, schools, wherever um, people have to make decisions for themselves, really. Um, instead of, I mean, I think we described, if you imagine the, the institution of democracy is a kind of one of those Victorian buildings that have the, 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 the metal things propping them up on the inside. It kind of feels a bit like that to me. It's been hollowed out from, from underneath it and you kind of have to rebuild 
all of that. Well, maybe it was never there, you know, but there is a, I think there is an opportunity to build it now as we have like technology and, and people seem much more interested and conscious of, um, uh, 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 of wanting to take, take part, I think. OK, thank you. Dave Watson? And a number of local authorities, um, when they were making decisions, and, and uh, MSPs have referred to some of these, uh, our members had to write papers saying what are the pros and cons of, of doing that and what the evidence. I, I've read a few of them, and, and I think the, the difficulty is that the, the evidence trying to separate out voter decline and link that to those authorities that did allow posts. Remember, some authorities never allowed posters in, on, on, uh, on, on lampposts, and others, and others did. It was more prevalent in Scotland. Um, so I think the evidence that I've seen anyway, and I'm, I'm hoping to be corrected, but the evidence I've seen um, is difficult, I think, to justify one way or the other the argument that putting posters up improved turnout. Um, I'm obviously speaking about of our, of our members who have to take them down when political parties forget to do so. Uh, I, say, I would have to say that uh, although our members do have the benefit of cherry pickers, which uh, political parties uh, don't, uh, makes it a, a tad easier. Uh, but nonetheless, it's costly and, uh, and, and, and not a very thank thankful task as well. I think the important point is that, um, that there is a point about making a buzz around an election. Uh, I, you know, I remember at school you know, getting taught the, the, the basics of, uh, of elections. It was all a bit dry, but when we had the mock election, it, it livened the whole thing up and people then started to participate. So I think uh, anything which creates a buzz in the community around the election, I think, must be a good thing. So I, I suspect that, um, and I could be wrong, we'll find out later, that uh, those in the public gallery from Our Ladies and St Andrews, posters and lampposts will not be the clincher on whether they go <laughs> and vote uh, at the elections ne next May. Th th this may be ourselves, indulging ourselves a little bit in, rela in relation to that, but the idea of, about, Dr Benny has said about raising awareness and uh, Dave Watson about creating a buzz, so I guess the question again is uh, how, I mean if it's left to politicians, that has been turnouts continue to decline at local government elections, so how do we create that buzz? Any ideas, any thoughts other than posters? Uh, Kayleigh. Um, uh, around the, the parliamentary elections earlier this year, we took a, a bit of a different approach to creating that, that buzz for, for people who have learning disabilities. Um, just to, to say, normally the, the rate of people who have learning disabilities who vote is 30%, so there's a very low rate of voting. Um, the people who engaged with us last year, uh, earlier this year through, through the Enable the Vote campaign, 80% of them went on to vote and 86% said that, that that buzz that we'd created helped them make an informed decision about their vote. What we did was we kind of took the, the, the debate out of politics and, and created a dialogue because the traditional sort of hustings format doesn't really work for people who have learning disabilities. They're not getting the chance to, to engage, to ask their questions. They're not following necessarily a lot of the the jargon and stuff that's, that's going on. So we actually took the conversation cafe model, which I think is, is, is being used more and more with the third, within the third sector to actually have um, political party representatives going round tables individually and, and engaging as an individual with, with people who have learning disabilities rather than debating amongst themselves. So I think it's just thinking a little bit differently, but it's definitely about bringing people together for, for dialogue and debate and, and creating that energy. I think that's very helpful. And Elaine, I'm going to take in a little second. I'm just wondering if that's similar to what Willie Sullivan was suggesting about <coughs> going out to where people are already empowered and in control and speaking to them on their terms and their environment where they feel comfortable rather than, as we've all done as politicians, we put out the leaflets, we chap their doors, we ask them to come to hustings and public meetings on our terms. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that. Have I identified yeah. correctly? The sure, sure, exactly. I think that, that the simple things like the design of meetings that you spoke about, like where, where representatives go round tables and talk to people instead of set up, stand up on platforms, which again is an inequality of power, stand up on platforms and argue with each other. Um, it, it, you know, some people will enjoy that, but a lot of people don't. Okay. Uh, only because I, I saw uh, Elaine first, I'll take Elaine Smith, but Alexander, I've got you down, I want to come in for a comment, Elaine. Thanks, convener. And actually, I was a bit remiss because I should also declare an interest as a former modern studies teacher and still registered with the GTC. And I'm particularly going to do that because I want to refer back to something that Victoria said earlier. Um, and if we are trying to pretty much, if we're trying to motivate the new cohort, as, as Willie Sullivan put it, and trying to motivate younger people out to vote. I'd be quite interested in a bit more detail on what Victoria was saying about in schools. Do they then have a, a responsibility maybe to 
He explained to young people the importance of local government in the short term for next year's election. What kind of events should they be holding that are then beyond, reaching beyond the young people that are doing modern studies? Uh, Victoria? One of the biggest issues in particular, you know, again, that is exactly what we do, and I think that was prominent in the 2014, you know, independence referendum. We use a lot of our time as modern societies to actively register pupils, and again, as I said, visible campaigns are really, really prominent. It was a buzz around the school. Pupils were really engaged in it. Again, in the Scottish Parent election, the buzz went away because, again, the visible campaign was gone. But in terms of in school, you know, the biggest things that we are facing in schools just now in particular, across S1 to S6, as you know, is this, are integrated social subjects, is that, you know, S1 to S2, are integrated. So, for example, at the moment I'm doing single teacher delivery, modern studies, history and geography. So, in particular, a lot of our subjects, you know, like, for example, our local councils, our local government, how important that is, has actually been delivered by a non-subject specialist. And now, to, for me, it's great, it's, it's a general understanding, but in terms of the level of enthusiasm that a non-subject specialist can deliver is a big issue. And again, a lot of modern studies um, teachers are feeling that across the country, that, you know, how effective is integrated social subjects, you know, and trying to increase, you know, young people's awareness of the importance of, you know, different levels of government, because again, we do cover that very superficially in first and second year normally. At nationals, you know, it's examinable content, you know, so we do definitely emphasise how important local government is. But I think, you know, taking it outside the modern size classroom is very, very important. You know, it is part of a citizenship agenda. It is part of, you know, developing pupils to become more politically literate. I think, you know, it's a whole school agenda. It's not just a modern study teacher's agenda. That There should be time invested across the school, whether it be, you know, election events across the school, week, work, week's worth events, you know, a page or two in um, PSE just isn't enough, you know. It should be you know a week or two worth of events to, to increase and engage young people in terms of the matters that work and again kind of like what you said about enable scotland ensuring that you know it's a level of discourse you know it's not a, a discussion it's not a debate it's a level of discourse of what's happening you know accessible information for young people as well and particularly you know in deprived areas as well making sure the information is available to them in a, an easy to format to an extent that, that's very helpful and very passionate um, and take on board what you say about not, not, not being the, the job of the modern studies teacher and it does, does scream curriculum for excellence Le of all definitely but there will be young people who will just never be that engaged with school and there are other locations where young people also hang out be it uh, a football community the swim club the community centre wherever so it's back again, I think, maybe to the, the, the point that Kayleigh was making and Willie was making about going to where people are and young people aren't just in school. So any other, because what we're looking for is, yes, that long-term approach, but kind of short-term solutions to driving up interest in the election that we've got before us. So have a think about other suggestions that, that our witnesses would like to make. Alexander Stewart, whilst they're doing that, so catch my eye now, if you want to come in with those comments and suggestions. Alexander, you did want to come in and make a comment. Thank you, Convener. I think it's been very interesting to hear the motivation uh, that individuals believe that groups should have. And I do believe that there is a, a motivation in the younger voter. And I, and I still think we have a motivation in the older voter or the grey market uh, that do come out to local government elections. Uh, it's the market in between. It's the sort of 25 to 55 year old that we seem to have a problem trying to identify why they do not believe that the vote at a local government is relevant uh, because in, in any other vote they do come out. Uh, but so I, I, it would be interesting to get some people's views about that sector uh, and how and how we should be engaging with that sector uh, to try and influence them. Because my perception, having been a councillor for uh, four terms, is that we, our impact on that sector is probably quite intense. You know, we, we look after uh, the young and the old, but the ones in the middle, uh, we, we also try to do as much as we can to support them, uh, and they, their influence within local government it isn't, isn't always there. So I, it, I'd like to some views about how people feel we should manage that market uh, and try and get them buzzed up and get them in, involved and, uh, and motivated to come out and support. Okay, and you've put that down there. I, I know our witnesses will be thinking about that, but I know Debbie King had wanted to, to, to come in. I, mean, I suppose just to go back to one of the previous points, um, the work we've done with the Electoral Commission on the last five elections, both referendums and elections, has, has been more about awareness raising, about getting people to understand about registering to vote, which I know is kind of the step behind kind of where you're looking at it, trying to get people out. But I think the importance of that side of things plays into those hard-to-reach groups. I mean, we know that there's... Um, 
There's a lot of people who, who are students on, in the sort of older student range who are in, in um, private rented sector and they're very underrepresented and understanding why that is and why they're not understanding that actually the process for registering and then going on to vote is really important. So how we get out the information to them. So in terms of our campaigns, which were awareness raising ones, it was very much about getting out through the media, which was the kind of one of the biggest routes we had to get out to people who are homeless or in, in um, the student population or tenants, but also using um, social media and using the channels that other people sort of tend to use and just trying to engage that way because tenants are very hard to reach even for us and we get a lot of them approaching us. So we use our website to try and get out. So it's using all those kind of methods where people might sort of um, engage more and see that actually this is something that could be, they could register and then go on to vote if they're kind of motivated to do so. Okay, thank you very much, Debbie. Um, Dave Watson. Yeah. On the practical, I mean, I, I think it is important that, that it's not just a matter for local government uh, or politicians or political parties, frankly. I think civil society has, a, has an important role here. I mean, we do, like others, a lot of work in terms of ensuring our members are registered. There's a much higher percentage of trade union members register vote, and as a result of some of that work, we also encourage a much higher level of postal voting. But I think the, and that's important, that you know, obviously you know, there's no point in trying to engage people to vote if they're not registered. Um, but I think the, the next stage really is around the election. And I think, uh, I, I, I really do think it's important. We've rather, we tried two different models. We tried the traditional hustings model and you know, obviously a number of politicians have had to come along and stand up on platforms and be grilled by, by our members on local government and, and other issues. But I do think um, we tried other models and last, year, last local government election, we got a number of our local government groups and actually got the politicians to do the table thing, to go around and talk to them. Uh, I have to say, the politicians said to us they found that a lot more challenging than the hustings model, um, but our members said they found it a lot more useful because you, know, you might think, well, trade union members are more than happy to stand up and, uh, uh, and talk, but actually that ability to have an engagement with five or six people uh, rather than having to stand up in a big hall of 100 people uh, was very important in, in that engagement. The only point I would put back to the political parties, I have to say, is, and it's a point that the union like, like ours makes very, very often and was made last time round, uh, obviously 75% of our members are women, uh, and they did make the point very often that uh, the politicians that were coming to talk to them didn't always reflect the society as a whole. Now, we know, for example, that councils have got only 25% of women, um, and, 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 and I haven't seen the exact data for ethnic minorities, but I, I suspect it's not, it's not that good either. So I think if... Uh, uh, political parties have a role to ensure their candidates are more reflective of society. I think that it encourages the sort of engagement we've talked about. Okay, thank you, Mr. Watson. Um, yes, Ruth. Just, uh, I'm not a modern studies teacher, I'll just say before we start. Um, <laughs> not yet. Um, just on that point about the different kinds of engagement, I um, did a couple of those sort of conversation still cafes, one with the older um, people's group and one with Oxfam. And it was more challenging, but it was also more enjoyable because it allowed that, that conversation. And if you give an answer, the person could come back. And I, th I think it's, um, it's, it's really worth noting how good they are. Um, I also just wanted to mention when we're talking about um, getting young people registered, it's a shame Sarah's not here yet, so I'll give a um, mention to the youth workers. Certainly in North Ayrshire, um, our youth services team did huge amounts of work um, getting young folk um, registered and the participation levels were, were quite high. So I think on that point about going out to where, to where young people are, so the youth clubs and, and things like that, not just um, schools is, is crucial. Okay, any comments on that? I'm not seeing anyone trying to attract my attention at the moment. Dr Denny. Um, I was maybe just going to address the question about, I think essentially what Alexander Stewart is saying is about generations yeah. um, and how, you know, we do have these strategies that, that target young people and, and older people. And, and I do agree with what you said, that we sometimes miss the, the big middle area. Um, and certainly, you know, having looked at attitudes towards voting, there, there is real generational change at work. So, you know, older voters do feel a real commitment to voting. And, you know, we talk about civic duty to vote. And that, that doesn't exist um, amongst younger generations. And, and I guess, you know, I would like to make that point without being critical of it. I think we just need to understand that there are, there's societal change at work. And, and that leads on to the point that perhaps 
40% turnout is not a bad turnout in a local election for a, a set of elections where that, you know, the, the level of government is, is not seen as, an, as important as, as other levels of government. But that then leads to the point of, well, perhaps we should be talking about longer term reform to local government and giving it more teeth, not, not less um, teeth. And, and I think that might get to the, the heart of, of the problem here. Yeah, Graham. Oh, sorry, Graham, I will take you in, but I want to give preference, and I will take you in directly next, but um, I'll take Willie Sullivan in first, and then I'll come to you, Graham, okay? Yeah, I think if you get 40% in, in the next election, it'll be, 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 be pretty good. Um, but I don't think that's enough, really. Um, uh, be, because, you know, the democratic system relies on that voting for its legitimacy and the turnout for its legitimacy, and if 60% of the population aren't voting on it, it's a kind of vicious decline, you know? Less people that vote for it, less important it seems, less legitimacy it has, and less people will vote for it. So I, so I do agree we need long-term approach, which is about flushing power through the system. It's about, you know, people, and not necessarily just, as I've said, not just about the elected bodies having that power, but the communities having the power in all sorts of different ways. And then I think they, you know, um, then I think that's the necessary long-term strategy. Because I have, you know, like, like, like the book I mentioned in my support, the populist uh, signal, I'm concerned about democracy. I'm concerned about the, that de decline in legitimacy. Because it's not because people, a lot of people don't vote, not, it's not because they, they, they don't have the time or they don't have the information. It's actually a conscious political decision not to go, I'm going to give you legitimacy because I don't think you're legitimate. Um, and that's a worry. Thank you. Um, Graham. Yeah. Um, so it really follows on from what, Dr. Benny was, was saying, um, I was struck by three submissions that we received, one from yourself, Dr. Benny, uh, one from uh, Unison, and one from uh, Dr. Gilmore, who's, who's not here, um, all making the same point. Sorry. For the record, um, because anyone watching would realize what happened there, but yes, he is here, and he thank you for here acknowledging that. that. Well, thank good, you for coming good along. To, good to see him. Um, so all making the same point that when power, when people perceive power as being eroded from local government, they don't see the point in voting in council elections. And you've all used powers in your submissions. Dr. Benny uh, talks about eroded powers. Unison, you talk about powers moving away. And Dr. Gilmore talks about a significant decrease in powers. Um, so I think when when people see that, when, when people think there is little point in this, they won't vote. Okay. Anyone want to come in and explore the idea of additional powers, whether to local government or whether it's passing from this tier or others to local government or indeed from local government into communities? Um, Mr. Watson. I mean, obviously, uh, low government reform is a pretty big issue, but uh, uh, I think the important point from an elections point of view is that, um, yeah, there is a perception, obviously, that we have a very centralised state, and that's not about any recent decisions. You know, obviously, powers have gone from local government, like police and fire and others, but it's more about the fact that even before that, local authorities in Scotland were some of the largest in Europe, not the largest in Europe, and we, we've put some of, some of these statistics there, and obviously there was the local democracy commission which went into this in in some detail uh, and talked about just the scale i remember doing a meeting in this very in this very room um when we had some colleagues from 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 norway over to talk about their system there and there was a uh, a lady present at that meeting who lived in lived in fife and she said and she was norwegian she came in she said um she said i, I live in kakoti she said and when i arrived um i said where's the local council and they said oh it's fife and she said, um, she said, isn't that a region? And didn't that used to be, you know, a, a, a nation in its own, in its own right? In, in Norway, um, Kokodi would have had its own council. And, and there is that whole issue of, of actually being local and doing that. But I don't think that in itself would work because, you know, easy to say to government, well, as we do, uh, more should be decentralised, more power should go locally. There is an argument for smaller local authorities in, in that context where the pressure tends to be in the other direction because of the alleged economies of scale of having bigger councils. So the pressure is there. But I do think that had, if you did do that, and we would obviously argue that's the case, it's also then incumbent on councils to 
play their role in that, and, and councils playing their role would be about that local engagement. So, you know, there are mechanisms that councils try, citizens, juries, participatory budgeting, all of those things, and the, and the, the present Scottish Government, I know, has put that in their, in their plan to encourage more of that. And I think some of those mechanisms uh, can work, but I think there's got to be a feeling that, you know, you're not just being token consultation as, and, and that there's actually a real power and a real engagement from local people. If they got that, then I think they're more likely to participate in the, in the local elections. Thank you, uh, Mr. Watson. Uh, Willie Sullivan? Yeah, I think it's difficult because we've never really had high turnouts in, in local government elections in Scotland. Um, and it might be, and, and in other countries, particularly some of the, the Scandinavian countries, they have like 70, 80% turnout in these elections. Um, so in some ways it's about a, a, a culture and, and a way of thinking about where power is and how it's used and how it operates. And Leslie Riddick says this, it's a British point of view that power comes from the top and is, is given down, you know, and it's, 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 in, in all, it's embodied in all of us, the way we think about it, a lot of us anyway. So I think that, for, if we're talking about long term now, then that kind of, that culture has to, to shift. And the only way that people will realise that they can do stuff for themselves and for each other and will trust each other and have confidence in their own communities to, you know, run energy companies or run healthcare or, or, or run their own housing would be by letting them try it and do it. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to come on that theme? Kelly? Um, well, I'm not really going to come in on the sort of reform theme. I think that's probably a, a longer term discussion. But in terms of that importance of understanding what, what your local council does, um, I think that, that's, that's hugely important is, is educating people and, and talking to people about what decisions they make and what powers they have and, and what influence they have on your life. Certainly from our perspective, a lot of the issues that we've seen raised at, at the parliamentary hustings were decisions that were made locally and were, were issues that were that could be influenced locally rather than at a parliament level. Okay, th thank you very much. Now, Elena, I will take you in a second, but I know Andy White has been quite patient. Uh, you, you indicated earlier you want to come in. Do you still wish to come in, Andy? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Yes, just picking up a little bit on that conversation, I mean, I'm intrigued at the extent to which, and Lynn Benny cites some figures about, um, you know, since the 1940s, turnout has been broadly below 50% for local government. We're doing better than England, a little bit better than Wales. Um, but that does contrast with other countries like Austria and Denmark and Finland, which are all in the 60% range uh, and above. And I was particularly struck, struck reading a paper recently on the Icelandic elections where they say that looking as far back as data has been collected, voter participation in Icelandic local government has always fluctuated between a maximum of 87.8% and a minimum of 81.9% until 2006 when it dropped below 80%, leading to um, a, a bit of a, a fuss when it fell below 80%. We're now below 40%. I'm just wondering why, I mean, are there, is there any merit or have any studies been done to look at why voting in most other European countries is consistently higher than it is in the UK as a whole? Why is it consistently higher? I mean, I just think it does come back to, to what's been said around the table that, that you know local government is structured differently. Um, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on Iceland, um, but I think there are different layers of government where the, the responsibilities are, are clearer, and it would be seen more broadly as a more democratic system. Um, so I think I think you know what, what you're citing there is proof that local elections can produce high turnouts in certain circumstances and certain conditions with certain powers attached to, to, to the, the body that they're electing. Um, so it's not anything about you know Scottish people or British people that's different here. It's the it's the structures of government that are different. I think it's both. Do you yeah. think? Yeah, I think. Well, I, I guess one culture, breeds culture, a culture. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah. You do you add anything to that, Willie? No, just, I mean, I, 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 I think I spoke a little bit about the culture, but the culture begets the structures that people accept and they work with. So, like, we all give our taxes to the centre and then our taxes are distributed down the way, whereas in uh, a lot of these states that have high turnouts, much of the tax is collected uh, locally and then yeah. given up in a kind of confederal uh, arrangement. And then, I get the other thing that is often said is that these, in a lot of these states, uh, the structures of local government are um, uh, constitutional. They can't just be done away with by a higher body. 
Um, I think that's again that way of thinking about where power is. You know, it's power is given from from the top and allowed from the top instead of allowed from the bottom up. Um, it was interesting. I was up at Kirk and Tillich SNP branch last week talking about local democracy as a as an invitee, and there was a discussion there about how central government was going to vet uh, community councillors, and there was there was half the room were quite outraged that central government would decide who was capable of being a community councillor or not. And that's, you know, that's something to explore and understand why, why we think in that way, why we think that the top should vet the grassroots all the time. Is there all, just whilst we're on looking a little bit at, at structures, Mr Watson, I'm just wondering, we have moved, of course, uh, to much larger multi-member council wards, where back in the day, whether you liked it or not, or thought it was more or less democratic, um, everybody knew who their local councillor was, whether you liked them or whether you voted or didn't vote them, there was almost an intimacy to the to the voting process. That was the guy or that was the woman, unfortunately mostly a guy, that who, who, who was your local councillor, and you knew who the other candidates were. You probably did get a knock at the door. You probably did see them down the local supermarket. But some of these awards are, are huge now. So I know that's structured again. I'm just wondering, just leave that sitting there. Um, Mr Watts, I know you wanted well, to come I, in. I mean, I think, I mean, we, we were one of the organisations that argued very strongly for proportional representation of local government uh, and, and also to separate it from, from national elections, which did create a, a higher turnout because people were voting in a national... In fact, uh, it's one of the very few occasions where um, we were actually supporting a Conservative private member's bill at the time, um, which, was, um, uh, which was actually David Mundell's originally and then um, Brian Monteith actually took it over um, in terms of separating the, 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 two, the, two, the two elections. I'd have to say it probably hasn't delivered, obviously clearly hasn't delivered an improvement in turnout, not in fairness that that was our primary motivation for supporting it, but um, it, it hasn't in, its, in itself done that. So I think we need to move on and look at other reasons for that. One of the, you know, I, I, I spoke at our Sister Union in Norway's conference uh, last year and had an opportunity to have a long discussion because they have obviously a, like 400 odd local authorities and uh, in fact one of them drew their island for me and I assumed there would be one council on this island. Uh, actually, there were three. Uh, when you saw the mountains, you understood why. But the important point was that the, the staff there said that, um, yes, it's very small. There were two things they felt were important. One was that they were a unitary authority. So public services were not delivered by 10 or 12 or 15 bodies that we pull together in community planning. So, you know, the, 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 the local police, the, uh, the, the primary schools, primary health care, you know, were all delivered essentially by the same council. So they could, there was a joining up there um, uh, of services. There was a unitary authority. They didn't have Quangos from Oslo, um, you know, running, uh, running a range of services in that area. The other interesting point, talking to some of the individual members, where that they felt uh, with that smaller council a real connection with their community. As the officer in charge of the care, the one care for the elderly home in, in one authority said to me, I'm not worried about the once a year inspection from an inspector from Oslo coming down. I'm more worried about being nobbled in the supermarket about the quality of care in my home. And it brought that sort of really local element to it. Now, that's not, you know, so I think, I think there is much to be said for that model. There are economic and other arguments strongly in the other direction. Uh, but I, I'd agree, Willie. I think we do need to start thinking about government building up from the bottom rather than, rather than building down from the top. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any of our witnesses want to come in? I'll move on to Elaine Smith. Oh, sorry, Willie, yes. Just, just on ward size, I mean, just to say I was a councillor in Dunfermline uh, uh, for one, one period in Dunfermline Central Ward, which was a massive ward, four-member ward. And even though I, I, got, I got paid some money for doing that, as councillors do, just if you're indulging me in my personal experience for a minute, um, uh, I couldn't really do that job properly in a way that I, that I wanted to. It was just far too big and far too many people to represent and do a, another job as well. Um, but I would have loved to have just looked after the little part of the town that I lived in, Park Nook. I would have done it, we you know, half a day a week for nothing, gradually as a public service. Um, so I think there's many, and, and, and I was in my mid-40s then, but I was the, the, the youngest person in the Labour group at that time. But I just think that, you know, there's lots of people who would want to represent their local community if it was of a manageable size um, and, and they would be much more connected than trying to run these big massive wards. Um, and main point on that, although is 
the size of the ward is not, it is a product of the system, but you know, you know, this, this, the system's not really the problem, the level of representation is the problem. You could have a proportional system with a lot more councillors and, and it would deal with that problem of that ward size. Thank you very much. Um, Elaine? Well, actually, um, when I indicated earlier, convener, these were the issues I wanted to explore, so if I can just take it a wee bit further, if that's okay. Um, so it's helpful, the discussion we've been having. So Dave Watson actually has figures in Unison's submission, which is one councillor per 4,270 4, people in Scotland, and in France it's one pair 125, which I think goes back maybe to what the point Willie Sullivan was making there. Um, and I wondered from Dr Benny's figures about the average turnout in local government elections by decade. These don't seem to be split down, so I just wondered whether there is any figures around for district councils and whether the turnout for the district councils was higher than for the regional councils, for example, because, again, that takes us back to the point you yourself made, convener, and, again, building on what Willie Sullivan said, that in district councils you did have smaller areas where people lived, the people knew the councillor, um, just an example from, from when I was younger and living in a flat in Sykeside and across the road was council, the, the, the local councillor who was quite happy for you to knock her door and happy for everybody in that community because she knew them and she would deal with them. So I would be interested in whether or not the turnout was better for districts. So what we've had over the past number of years is a reorganisation from uh, of the districts and the regions and then a further reorganisation of the voting system to proportional representation. And it seems to me, then, what jumps out at me is Dr Benny's words in her submission, which is, the structure of local councils is ripe for review and reform. And maybe for the longer term, that's something that we do have to actually start to consider. OK. Anyone want to come in and make any comment in relation to that? But it does fit in very well with, with, with what the, the current theme has been. Dr Benny, have you got anything to add I mean, I to say, that? I think, I think we're all hinting in some way or another at, at some kind of fundamental reform that would look at you know, community involvement and the kind of bottom-up approach as opposed to top-down. But you know, there are really fundamental issues of reform that obviously um, wouldn't happen before the next set of elections. Um, on, on the question of district and regional um, turnout. I, I, I don't know. I can look that up for you. Um, those figures are amalgamated um, figures. Um, I suspect they were quite similar. Um, but I think it goes back to that notion of, you know, the perceptions of power. Um, so it's not just about the locality. It's about the perception of what, what the district um, and regional councils did then. Um, but it's worth investigating that further, I think. Okay, I'm just conscious that, that, that one of the things running through this is we're saying one of the ways to make, make, make a local government more intimate and direct is it's more power in local areas, but it might also be more politicians, dare I say, which might not be popular in itself with the people that are not voting in these elections that we've, that we've left behind. So there might be a slight conflict there. Sorry, Mr Sullivan. Just to say, I mean, I, I, I think my colleague was here last week, Katie, and we, we made a submission on, on that because we, we did some polling on uh, April this year and asked... I think in, in response to the, it wasn't just a, a, an open question, it was in response to the levels of representation comparing Scotland to, to Europe. We asked people if they did want more councillors and, and when we asked them if they wanted them to be more community volunteers who weren't paid, then it was in the high 80s, I think, people wanted more councillors. And then we, 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 we thought, well, obviously people will want more for nothing. Um, but then we asked them, would you want more councillors even if they were paid as, uh, as they are at the moment? And it was still in the high 70s. So when people realise that, that they have not the level of representation, an, ab an abnormal level of representation, that this idea, and I know mo most people go, nobody wants more politicians, but actually they do. the evidence shows when you ask people what their views of politicians are, it's negative. But when you actually say, tell me about your local politician, they tend to say, oh, they're differently, actually, they're really helpful, this, that, and the other. So it's politicians are classic, it's the, get, get the, the bad reputation, but actually individually in their communities, it tends not to be so bad. He, he says naively hoping, perhaps. Uh, Mr Watson. I mean, it's not an easy sell. You know, we, should have, we should have more politicians, but I, I, I think we are talking about a different type of politician that this point that Willie's trying to make is that, I, I mean, I remember some years ago um, a, a, a government minister uh, said that uh, councillors are part-time. Uh, the, the outrage from a number of uh, local councillors uh, was uh, absolutely not. I would. In fact, some councils, I remember, even ran double page 
features in the local newspaper to show that their first meeting was at 7 o'clock in the morning, their last was at 10 o'clock at night, just to make the point to said minister that they weren't part-time. The trouble is it's entirely contra to where we wanted to go. Actually, we've got too many full-time or at least a lot of retired. The age of councillors is too old. Very few people of working age uh, actually do this and do another job as well. Part of that, of course, is because of the workplace. We have to recognise that you know, civic roles are not as perhaps as respected by a lot of employers in the way that they used to be. Remember, the statutory entitlement to time off to carry these is there. But you know, whether it impacts on your promotion and, and other, other impact in the workplace means that people of a working age are perhaps less willing to be part-time councillors as they should be in the main uh, and than they used to be. So I think that we need to think about uh, about making it more part-time. They were smaller, the role was, was not as large, the, the wards were smaller. That would, I think, make it a lot easier for people to volunteer and be prepared to do it. And I think, but I do think the, the last point is in, in relation to the districts and regions. We should remember that district councils had very limited powers and some of them had even less than that. Same, same is true for community councils. I think if you're going to make it worthwhile to some of the working age to allocate some of their time to it. They've got to feel they've got some power to change things in their community, and that means having the right powers at the right level. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sullivan, yes? Yeah, just to, to come in on what Dave said, that's... Same poll that we did in, uh, did in April. We asked, because I've got another one of these myths is that the people just want somebody to go and do stuff for them. They don't want to be involved in running their, their local community. I think it was 25% of people were willing to give up a day a month to help run their local uh, community. Um, and we asked that, in quite, that question in quite a hard way because we gave them options of saying, no, I'm too busy, or no, um, I've got more important things to do. And it was only small numbers of people that, that took that option. But another interesting part was that of the people that said the, there was actually 6% of people that said they were willing to give up three days, three days a, 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 a month as well. But the, of the, op the people that said they weren't willing to give up any time, 22% of them said it was because they didn't feel they had anything to contribute. So it wasn't so much they didn't want it, it was more a level of capacity and, and confidence. And I think that's, a, as I said, that's a vicious circle. You need to give people the ability to make decisions and, and, and get involved in their local community in order so that they will have the confidence to keep doing it. Okay, thank you. No, I've done. So, sorry, um, Debbie, were you wanting to come in there? It's just yeah, very sorry. quickly, it, it does resonate very much with, with work that we do with Charter Scotland with service user involvement. It's around enabling people to make decisions, to get experience, to kind of move on, on with their lives and kind of move up to what, what they want to do and very much around elections and getting people involved, getting people registered. It's around supporting and empowering people within the community which does resonate with having like the, the system which is more intimate perhaps and more geared towards recognizing what the community needs are what people's needs are in the community and i think definitely if there's the support there in the long term to get people with lived experience of homelessness for example to then go on sort of to maybe become a councillor that's something that's some you know that adds to what happens within the council and how decisions are made thank you very much now a couple of our msp colleagues I don't wish to kind of make comments, but I'm conscious after that we'll have around 10 minutes or so left. So, um, again, let's look at the long-term stuff. We do have council elections in, in, in May, and we are keen to hear any suggestions that you think. So, really, a, an opportunity to prompt you to get and have a think about how this committee could be usefully involved going forward uh, in relation to that, or what a uh, government can do or local authorities can do to give some additional support to driving turnout at, at, at next year's elections amongst everyone, not, not just underrepresented groups. Um, so have a think about that, and I'll, I'll, I'll give priority the last 10 minutes to, to our witnesses. Uh, but uh, Mr Gibson and Elaine Smith has... Yeah, it's just an issue that's not been touched on, convenient when we're talking about turnout. I think the media has had a very pernicious effect in terms of attacking all politicians of all parties, year in, year out, at all levels. And I think that's deterred a lot of people, not only from voting, but from putting themselves forward uh, in terms of going through the democratic process. 
process. I think also the issue of remuneration. I think if we're going to, I, mean, I certainly am a great uh, believer in, in local government reform, but if we're going to work with the system we've got now, then we need to have a level of remuneration that does attract people into local government to serve because people of working age simply can't afford to do so. And so we have a, you know, there's an issue about gender, but there's even more, I believe, a disproportionate issue about older people, retired people actually being councillors uh, rather than people of young age. So I, th I think there's a, a, a number of issues there that, that have to be addressed. The issue of the media, I don't think that's one we're always going to have to, to wrestle with, but it certainly does, I believe, have a detrimental effect on who wants to involve Sorry, themselves in politics. What does me want to comment? I'll take it in a second, <coughs> Mr Sullivan. What I'm going to do is I'll take Elaine Smith in just now, and that allows us to give the last 10 minutes or so to, to our witnesses rather than the MSPs, Elaine. Thanks very much, convener. Just focusing on next year, um, and a couple of points. We've extended the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds, but what we haven't done is extend their ability to stand as councillors. And I actually had an issue where a young person was keen to stand and can't because um, although they can vote, they can't actually stand as a candidate. So that's one issue maybe that we need to think about. And another issue is proxy vote. And I raised it last week actually at the committee with the minister and Dr. Benny raised it in her submission. And how easy is it when something happens to someone? I think it, actually people are being disenfranchised because getting a proxy vote maybe isn't that easy either. So these are other issues too, I think, for next year that maybe need addressed. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'll take Mr Sullivan just now, but if the other witnesses could maybe, you may not get the opportunity to come back in again after this round of, of kind of comments. So if you could maybe indicate if you get something you want to see in the next 10 minutes. Mr Sullivan. When, when Kerry was speaking there, it just reminded me, I, I heard this guy saying if Tesco's and Sainsbury's attacked each other in the way that political parties do, then nobody would shop in supermarkets. <laughs> um, so, um, something to think about. Um, uh, one thing to do that, that well, well, Electoral Reform Society, along with a coalition of lots of organisations, is, is, is launching a campaign called Act As If You Own The Place Before Next in May's local elections, which is we, we're setting up, we're partnering with community groups in different communities um, to hold Act As If You Own The Place events, which are kind of uh, uh, weekend, well, day-long uh, deliberative forums where local communities can come and, and have a discussion, a structured discussion, uh, using deliberative techniques to think about what they would do if they actually ran their local town or community. So any any support, I know Fife, Fife Council is part of the coalition, so any uh, councils, community groups, or uh, I mean, uh, we're doing one with a, uh, a political party up in, uh, I forgot where it was now, but um, an SNP branch is doing it. So we want as many and diverse partners as possible to run these, these events. So anybody willing to help, the website will be launched on the 21st of November. Kayleigh Thorpe. Thank you. Um, it was just to, to really touch on, on disenfranchised um, people in terms of what, what Aline mentioned. In our submission, we um, talked about some of the additional barriers that are faced by people who have learning disabilities, and, and particularly that I would like to raise that I've not had the chance to yet is around limiting expectations of people's ability to vote and people's right to vote. Um, there are still some misconceptions that people with learning disabilities are, are not allowed to vote, um, and, and some of our members and people we support have faced that. So I think that that polling place staff are not immune to those misconceptions and actually we need to do a bit of work to train and to support polling place staff to ensure that nobody's turned away from, from their right to vote. Thank you very much, Kayleigh. Uh, Dave Watson. In returning to probably to some of the practical things you do do for next year, I mean, one of the difficulties is obviously we represent registration staff who who, who, are, who are responsible for for doing um, all the registration work. I think, you know, as you will be aware, a lot of councils have had to cut back on anything which is not absolutely statutory uh, because of the cuts to local government spending. So the time to do this, but I think so. If there was a uh, even if it was a one-off funding boost to uh, to allow registration staff to do some of the things that they used to do. I, I always remember, you know, I came to work in Scotland 26 years ago, and I, I having lived in, in England for, for a number of years, and I was mightily impressed because there was a gap in the register in my area that a registration, two registration turned up on my doorstep uh, to find out why why there wasn't a registered person at that address. Uh, I suspect that's pretty, pretty rare these days, but there are things that the registration officers are trying to do, and they could do 
more of um, going to schools, for example, to register 15-year-olds in advance of the 16, 17-year-old. Uh, so not just you know doing the awareness, but actually going there and, and actually uh, doing doing the registration is is important as well. Um, perhaps we might also um, in the the Scottish government's excellent um, you know, Fair Work Convention initiative, perhaps uh, build something in there about the the civic role of employers and trade unions in terms of uh, promoting uh, elections and uh, and providing some space within that certainly for employers to to uh, to to recognize that civic role and encourage people to stand and to vote and, and also generally encourage more buzz and awareness around it and 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 may I do take the point about about the media but the, the other point about the media, of course, is local media has been significantly weakened in, in, in recent years. It's much smaller than it used to be. We all know that a lot of our local newspapers are run by one journalist uh, in the main, lots of syndicated stuff. Uh, some, um, some, some funding towards publicity might boost some of the finances of the papers, enable them to take a, a more active role. So I think that's probably four practical things I'd end up by offering here. Yeah. Precisely what we were asking uh, witnesses to do. Does anyone? It's like Debbie King. Yes. Maybe just to emphasise those practical points in terms of people who are homeless. We've got over 10,000 people in temporary accommodation. Around 5,000 people slept rough in Scotland last year. These are not small numbers. We've got 35,000. Around 35,000 people had homeless applications last year. There's, there's a large percentage of the population. 350,000. Um, households in the private rented sector. So it's again, it's around the registration, it's around the registration officers understanding the declaration of local connection that people can make, which often they don't know, and definitely sort of lots of people that we work with don't understand. So it's around that information and support again, just to emphasize that it's kind of important if you want to involve people and to get them to be able to exercise their right to vote, to make sure that they're supported to do so. Okay, thank you, Debbie. And I uh, don't know if, uh, Victoria, do you want to? Thank you. Again, kind of more emphasise, you know, more time needs to be invested in schools. I know a few had kind of commented on about going to the young people within their community, but again, a lot of the feedback and a lot of particular communities that I've worked in, there's not a lot of services for young people, for politicians to come out and see them at. So again, school is the main driver and it's the main access point for, for young people. So again, having individuals come in and you know, emphasise the importance of registration. Again, as a modern science teacher, and again, we've, we've been pushing that since the referendum, since the change in voting age. And again, we're continuing to do that. But again, time is very limited in school. And again, it's about emphasising that you know, there, is, there is a need for more time again, across the whole school, rather just in the modern size remit. Because again, there's a lot of pupils within Scottish schools that don't even choose the subject. So how can we reach these pupils as well across the whole school agenda? I very briefly touch upon you know, this whole idea. More, vis more visibility is really needed in terms of you know, raising um, young people's awareness of local government campaigns in particular. You know, there's a huge buzz around the EU referendum, the Scottish independence referendum. Pupils are very much engaged in that when it comes to local elections in terms of you're delivering a class they've not got an interest in it they're very in interested in the local area they're very clued up on it but in terms of you know wanting to go out and vote and make a difference they're not that bothered about it so again there needs to be greater visibility and whether it be posts I'm not entirely sure but again areas where people can um, kids can get access to information and go and choose to find that further for themselves thank you very much Victoria uh, yeah Willie Sullivan anything you want to add um I, I think what Dave said, those four points seem really, really useful. And um, obviously, I was, I was selling our campaign, but I think it is, you know, we, we, we just see ourselves as being a, a, a hub where we can connect lots of people who are doing stuff to get people interested in running their own communities. Okay, and uh, Dr. Benny. Yeah, um, I would just say, you know, the, these registration drives are clearly fundamentally important. Um, the next level is communicating to voters why they should actually vote. And, and I think maybe that's where public information campaigns could be a bit less technical, you know, in terms of how to vote using STV um, and move beyond that to, you know, why they should vote and what local councils do for them and the difference, you know, they make to their lives. I think that that is fundamentally important. But the other thing I would add is that I think in a way we need to get with, you know, modern societies and so I think we've mentioned social media, that's clearly very important in engaging um, young people. Um, but also you know, postal voting, proxy voting. We have to make it as easy as possible for people to vote in modern societies, and, and that might be something in the short term we could focus on. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, just a, a brief opportunity. The, the way these evidence sessions sometimes go, there's usually one witness sitting there who really wanted to say something, and the nature of the discussion doesn't give them the opportunity to say that. Uh, now is the time to... It's a final opportunity. Not for everyone. We don't have time for that. But uh, if there's something you really wanted to say and you've not had the opportunity to say it, um, feel free to, to get my attention now. Delighted that's not the case. Um, it allows us to stay on schedule. Can I, can I thank all the witnesses for their time here this morning? Uh, and just to let you know that the committee will consider the evidence we received today. It won't just sit there and, you know, the ether will, will seek to do something with it. And we'll have to decide our approach in relation to uh, really targeting a decent voter turnout at, at next year's elections, but also the longer term strategies that we heard with today. So thank you, everyone. And as previously agreed, uh, we now move into private session. Thank you.